Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by Hover. Register a domain name and build your online brand with Hover. Visit hover.com slash twit to get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. By ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash hamnation. And by LDG Electronics. LDG Electronics provides state-of-the-art automatic antenna tuners and related products for every amateur need. Visit ldgelectronics.com to learn more. This is Ham Nation, episode number 396 for April 3rd, 2019. Now with Extra Smoke. Ham Nation viewers, we are on the air with our first of the April show. Actually, the first week of April's uh, show. And we've got an exciting show tonight. But first, let's check and see how our hostesses are doing. And our hosts, Amanda, y'all tuned in, ready to roll? I'm ready to roll and I'm ready for real spring, Gordo. But in the meantime, <laughs> I'll just take your questions in the chat room and we'll hand them out at the end of the show. Oh, that sounds great. And Tim, we're almost ready for you to give us a full report on all the excitement, huh, Tim? It, last weekend was amazing, and Gordo, we're going to bring the whole story to you tonight. Oh, that's great. And George will be with us in just a, a few moments. Don is out there in the radio land. He's got stuff for us as well recorded. And um, speaking of recordings, if my voice gives out, it's because I've been behind uh, the microphone for two weeks doing the new audio for general class. The general class pool changes on July 1st, but quite frankly, it's not a huge change at all so not to panic if you got the old book you're going to do fine take the test before july 1st if not the new book will get you through afterwards but even the old book will probably work this coming weekend saturday april 6th the Senego valley amateur radio association is having its saturday bull thistle Ham Fest, and uh, this is going to be a fun one. It's at the Shinego County Pomona Grange, and uh, that is in Norwich, New York. So have a great Saturday. And then on Sunday, the TRARC near uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in Boston, PA, they're having their Ham Fest. You can learn more by going to www.trarc.net. So plenty of ham fest for all the excitement that's out there. Well, let me tell you, after this weekend, there was plenty of excitement. Listen, listen to this. Just listen. That was on my little dipole on 75 meters, and Kilo 3 Lima Radio was coming through loud and clear on 75 40 20 maybe even 15 out here on the west coast well tim how about giving us a recap on all the excitement and exuberance that uh, everybody had at k3lr tim well thanks gordo and uh, what a great recording you know 75 meters worked very well this past weekend even with some challenging conditions uh, things worked out beyond plan, beyond the expectations. And uh, we were just so excited to host these the six young operators, average age of 16 years old, here at wow. K3LR. So, uh, Victor, let, let's go to the slides. And so, um, thanks to Marty NN1C, who used to be KC1CWF, for putting together this slideshow. And... Um, for those of you who are coming to Hamvention, you'll be able to hear Marty live at the contest forum. And it's really a, a tremendous achievement that, the, that these youth operators did here at K3LR. So the next slide uh, talks about the fact that 
Um, the youth operators participated here at K3LR using the K3LR station in the CQWPX contest. And um, they, they really believed that they were going to uh, be very successful right out of the gate. And uh, so Team Exuberance was out to prove that they had a mission. And, you know, it, this was all Violetta's idea, KM4ATT. She had come to me and said, um, can I bring my friends, five of my <laughs> friends, to K3LR so we can have fun in a, in a big contest? And I couldn't think of a better event than the CQ Magazine's WPX contest where, uh, you know, we're able to work stations, DX stations and USA and Canadian stations all at the same time. So it was a big QSO party. And the operators that, that Violetta had invited, uh, Marty and Bryant and Tommy, and just were incredible uh, operators. Here you can see the, you know, and they're all very youthful, you know, 14 <laughs> years old, 15 years old, uh, 19 years old, and uh, limited experience. But, you know, the thing that impressed me was good parents really were the key to the the success uh, that these youth operators had. So keep going, uh, Victor, as we go through the slides. They came to K3LR, one of the largest stations in the world. But, you know, you, you can have all the hardware and all the radio equipment you want, but if you can't operate, it's just not going to happen. So they, uh, I coached them. I taught them very quickly on Friday afternoon how to use this hardware. And before they came to K3LR, they, they were treated to an afternoon at DX Engineering. And oh. uh, so here are the six operators are. And if you go from left to right, uh, that's Violetta, KM4ATT. She's 14 years old. And then Bryant, KG5HVO, who, who was the Young Ham of the Year in 2018. Bill Pasternak, Young Ham of the Year. Then it's Levi, K6JO, and Marty, NN1C, who was the 2017 Bill Pasternak Young Ham of the Year. Next to him is Tommy. Tommy is HA8RT from Budapest, Hungary. Wow. He traveled all the way to the United States for this youth opportunity. He is the first one in his whole family that has come to the United States. And uh, it was his first time here, and he was a tremendous operator. And lastly, on the right-hand side is David, VE7DZO. David is from British Columbia. Uh, his father immigrated to uh, Canada, British Columbia, 10 years ago, wanted a better life. What a great story, and David is a super operator. Go ahead, Victor. And so... Uh, at DX Engineering, all the kids, all the youth had to give a presentation. And uh, they had to talk about what got them interested in ham radio, what are they doing in ham radio, and what do they see the future is for them in amateur radio. How is it going to impress their life? So uh, there were six of the kids and three parents all gave great presentations to the DX Engineering staff on Friday before the contest. Next, there, and there there we are, we're on Facebook Live. Uh, Violetta had lined up so that there would be custom uh, hats for each one of the operators. So kind of a, a great lineup, and they were so excited uh, to be at DX Engineering and getting tuned up for the contest. And so they, they finally got to K3LR, and of course, like happens when you're going out and working on antennas, it was raining. <laughs> but what better way to tackle the rain than to have a DX Engineering umbrella? And uh, we had made sure that each one of the uh, parents and the youth operators had a DX Engineering umbrella. As I, I had to show each, uh, the, the whole team, what the antenna complement that they would be using. And so... They're here looking at the 20-meter the, uh, tower, which has got all sorts of Yaggies on it and uh, trying to take it all in during the rainstorm. Next slide. And so 
Uh, during the contest, here's Tommy on the left, HA8RT from Hungary, and Marty, and then one C from Boston. They're on. Uh, this is a 75 meter position, which is actually where I'm sitting. And uh, boy, just happy kids, just having fun on the radio and talking to people all over the world. And it was so cool that so many of the Ham Nation audience got on the air to work these kids. Next slide. And, and here's Violetta, KM4ATT, along with David, VE7DZO. They're on 40 meters. And uh, David is running them. And in between David's CQ QSOs or his running QSOs, Violetta is picking off all the search and pounce QSOs. So they're, <laughs> they're interleaving, learning to work together as a team. And uh, their transmitters are interlocked because... Uh, the rules state that you can only have one signal on the band at a time. And, boy, they, these these kids picked up on it right away. And Violetta being very smart, it, this was an amazing scene, Gordo. Next slide. And later on in the contest, uh, the 80-meter operators became Levi, K6JO, in the background, and David, BE7DZO, and, and again, utilizing the team aspect of going back and forth between the CQ station and the search and pounce station. Next slide. And a little bit of an overview. Here you can see uh, the 15 meter operators uh, in the background. And uh, one of the, there were, there were several rules during this contest. One of the rules was all of the youth had to have the top license in their country. So that means in the United States, they had an extra class license. Um, VE7DZO, David has the top license in Canada that he can. And uh, Tommy, HA8RT, has the top license in Hungary. We didn't want any problems from a licensing standpoint. On the right-hand side of this photo, you can see Levi, K6JO. He, you know, he loves radio and he loves surfing. And uh, I think his future is in uh, sports medicine. And, of course, Marty was there in the run chair on 20 meters. Um, Marty and Levi, the first hour on Saturday morning into Europe, had 200 QSOs in one hour. What a wow. tremendous. I mean, these kids were so good. Go ahead, uh, Victor. And uh, here's Bryant, KG5HVO. You know, uh, he's, he's uh, in the foreground here. Bryant, the first time that we worked Bryant, which was two years ago, um, he was uh, using his hand mic, the, the push-to-talk switch, he was using it as a CW key. And he worked oh. 55 QSOs during the CQ Worldwide CW contest, making CW QSOs, transmitting with his push to talk switch levi k6jo from san diego in the background and what a what a great team they made on 20 meters next slide and so here are the rotor boxes for the 20 meter uh, stack here at k3lr uh, this is uh, we use four yaggies uh, in a stacked array so it's six elements these are six element beams yaggies uh, optimized wideband arrays that are on 50-foot booms mounted at 230 feet, 170 feet, 110 feet, and 50 feet, and you put them all together so that you get 6 dB more gain over a single Yagi. And uh, they, in this case here, you can see they're all lined up on Europe. And, uh, and of course, uh, within the beam width, you can work India. So... Um, they put up a little sign that says CQ New Delhi. Next slide. And a, a little shot of the 20-meter stations. On the left side is the search and pounce. On the right side is the run station. Uh, that run station is one of the IC7850s, which is the special 50th anniversary unit that ICOM made. Um, and and uh, the 7851 is the same, but it's not gold. And, of course, uh, Marty just fell in love with that gold radio on 20 meters. <laughs> Next slide. And, it, and there's Marty having the time of his life. Um, he got so tired. I think he kind of 
was leaning in the chair. We had to tell him, Marty, you need to go to sleep. But he was on all of the bands and just could not get enough of it. Uh, here he is on 40 meters. Next slide. And so at the end of the contest, um, here it is, 6,007 QSOs. And you can see the breakdown by band. There were 79 QSOs on 160 meters, uh, 1,125 on 80 meters, and 2,352 on 40 meters, over 2,000 on 20 meters. 15 meters was not a great band, but 180 QSOs were made there. And the surprise of the weekend was that we actually made 46 contacts on 10 meters. Lots of prefixes and the final score of 23.79 million points, which is over a million points ahead of the third area call area uh, record for this WPX phone contest. So very, very excited. Go ahead, Victor. And so, you know, lots of QSOs in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and um, they, they they ate well. They worked hard. They were so <laughs> tired at the end. What an incredible story. Go ahead, Victor. And uh, here we always do a team photo at the end of each contest. And um, here they are. This is Team Exuberance uh, with Marty NN1C and David VE7DZO and Tommy HA8RT, Violetta KM4ATT and Levi K6JO and Bryant KG5HVO. What a tremendous group of very good youth operators. This is the future of ham radio. And I challenged them at dinner on Sunday night to go out, talk to their friends, talk to their radio clubs, get in front of HamFest where they have forums, where they can give the presentation on what uh, you know, contesting and getting on the air means to the youth. And uh, I, I think, you know, it's very, very bright. So congratulations to Team Exuberance. Go ahead, Victor. And so we really believe this was the first time that this was an all-youth, very serious contest operation in North America. We know it's been done in Europe before. And um, so th from a claim score, you know, these scores have to be checked by the magazine and the, uh, the contest adjudicators. But uh, from a claim score perspective, um, they, the team exuberance is number one in the United States in the multi-two category. And it looks like right now they're number three in the world in the multi-two category, which is an incredible way to start. I mean, Marty's projection sheets showed that he was going to be very happy if the team worked 3,600 QSOs. They ended up with over 6,000 QSOs. And that's just an incredible way um, to, to, to start off this whole very serious use, youth contest operating. And um, they're looking forward to the future. I'm sure this isn't the last time you're going to hear this. And I certainly hope that other station owners that have big stations invite youth in to have a great time on ham radio what do you think gordo they proved <laughs> it wrong that old age and treachery did not win over the youth and the exuberance of team exuberance next no slide. no matter how hard we tried tim <laughs> well let me tell you it was so exciting to hear those kids on the air, absolutely sounding like uh, old-time uh, pros on the DX uh, circuit. Uh, congratulations. Now, Tim, um, where may those of us that worked them on multiple bands uh, direct the QSLs to your QTH address? Yeah, so uh, the great thing is uh, Logbook of the World, which is a uh, just a phenomenal uh, deal that the American Radio Relay League has, ARL, uh, LOTW. The log has already been uploaded there. So electronic QSLs are already available at LOTW. But if you want a QSL card, we're going to do a special QSL card for Team Exuberance. 
And uh, so you can just send them to the K3LR address on QRZ.com, and you will get back a paper card that will knock your socks off. Terry, Kate, MNJ is working on that, and uh, we're going to have a great QSL card. So even if you get a, an electronic QSL card, you can always send in for a paper card. An SASE is nice, but you don't need to do that. I love QSLing, and so I'm always going to send you a QSL card, no matter no matter what you send here. So um, you know th that is the final courtesy of a QSO. You know that, Gordo. <laughs> well, that'll be great, and I can't wait to see that paper card as well as logbooks of the world. Well, Tim, can you stay with us for a little bit longer? Because I know when we get to uh, the questions uh, that Amanda will be probably asking you a bunch. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm certainly willing to stay here. You know, yesterday we had uh, uh, a visit from uh, Liz, KE8FMJ, who's the prize chairman at the Dayton Hamvention. And so, you know, we just go from a contest to a tour with Liz and showing her about the station here. And certainly uh, we're all getting excited about Hamvention. So I'm going to stick around. I'm going to be with you here, Amanda. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be on the show. And good to see George. <laughs> well, oh. George, what do you think about all of this exuberance that was pulled off this past weekend? George? I don't see how we can keep up, Gordo. I, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're in big trouble, but at least we're leaving ham radio in good hands, it, it appears so. And hopefully all that excitement will get some uh, more young people interested in the hobby. You know, it's a great hobby, and they, they just don't know about it, you know. Uh, but once they find out, boy, it looks like they're on fire with it. Well, thanks for bringing that to us tonight, Tim, and we'll get back with you here shortly uh, with some questions in the chat room. But right now, we've got a message from Don. Hey, I want to talk to you about Hover because this episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by Hover. And if you're building your online brand, it has never been easier. And your online brand has never been more important. Buying a domain name for your passion is the first and biggest step to building your personal brand online. And keeping your domain name separate from hosting gives you the flexibility to choose the right platform for your business. Because nobody wants to be stuck with a solution that doesn't fit their needs. And who doesn't need a domain name? You need a domain name. I need a domain name. Nowadays, it feels like everybody has one, so it's important that yours stands out. And Hover has over 400 domain extensions to choose from. My favorite, I think, is the .me extension. How cool would that be? AE5DW.me or your call sign .me. .me is a unique extension to use for your portfolio to showcase who you are and what you do. And if you've got a portfolio website ready to launch, go ahead and get that .me extension. Hover gives you best-in-class customer support team, no upsells, clean and simple user interface and experience, personalized email that matches your domain to further support your online identity. And the Hover Connect feature lets you connect your domain name to many website builders with just a few simple clicks. It's very clean. It's very easy. The customer service is second to none. So this year, find your domain name for your passion. Visit hover.com slash twit. You'll get 10% off your first purchase of any domain extension for the entire first year. Hover.com slash twit for 10% off your domain extension for a full year. And Hover, we thank you for your support. We thank Gordon West for his support as well, and he's got short shots now. Gordo, hit it. Hey, thanks, Don. Well, always good to hear from you, Don. And uh, we heard from K1S. T -O. Now, K1STO, Rosalie White, formerly with the American Radio Relay League and now working very closely with the American Relay League for the Amateur Radio International Space Station and those astronauts on the space station because next week we have an out-of-this-world auction sponsored by ARISS. And Victor, let's take a look and see what's going to happen at the auction. Well, the auction has two great prizes. 
One is the coveted ARRL handbook now in uh, six different uh, volumes because the current ARRL handbook was so large that um, uh, you almost needed a cart to get it around. Well, now it's much easier. And the ARRL handbook for 2019 has a special autograph six signed six times by six astronauts. So the, excuse me, not six astronauts, but a bunch of them, the astronaut signed six volume boxed uh, handbook is going to be one of the great grand prizes for the world auction. But the big grand prize that everybody is salivating at <clears throat> is the uh, Kenwood TS 890 and this too has also been signed by all of the astronauts now the bidding starts this coming monday at 1200 universal time coordinated and runs nearly a full week over on sunday so we encourage all of you to uh look at to the potential of maybe being the top bidder for the auctioned two product devices. And this one, of course, the Kenwood TS-890, uh, little brother to uh, what I have is the Kenwood TS-990, along with other gear. Uh, it's going to be a, a high auction item. Now, we'll give you more information about how to get on the uh, site for the auction. The auction site doesn't actually open up until Monday. And um, you would go to www dot a r i s s and um, i'll give you a little bit more of that as we get closer but it's going to be i think very important to log on first thing www.arisss.org you might want to go there now and see what's happening with this upcoming next week auction well, we know the importance of the amateur radio aboard the International Space Station. It's one great way to get kids involved in a hobby that, well, they thought maybe it was just an old man's hobby. Well, no, it takes more than uh, young men to uh, jump up to building tops and set up the antennas. This is a great antenna system for uh, working not only AMSAT's satellites, but also working the International Space Station. But you know, the International Space Station has such a strong signal, <clears throat> you might not even need the cross-polarized satellite antenna, but you do need a great tracking program. And again, AMSAT is where you want to go. And we hope all of you will join AMSAT because they help support the ARISS forum. But all this is about the ARISS uh, extravaganza to the World Auction, sponsored by ARISS. The schools really get behind a space station pass. Uh, many times uh, those in the school uh, drama labs and so on will get coordinated behind computers. So they're counting down when the uh, satellite or the International Space Station is going to make a pass. And to work either satellites or the International Space Station, no, you don't need all this kind of hardware on the roof. Really, almost an omnidirectional antenna for the International Space Station will do you just fine. So, nope, uh, you don't need ASL rotators because the International Space Station, to hear them uh, on uh, 145.800 or the APRS on 145.825, um, no, you don't need all of that huge hardware. You don't need all of this stuff. But it is fun once a school has been chosen, and they're now looking for more schools to talk to the space station. And uh, this was out at uh, Quartzsite, and this is uh, Neil, W6FOG, and his work through Ham Radio Outlet. He was able to coordinate all of the equipment, all of the antennas. He's got everything set up, and his team really put a great signal to the International Space Station about a year ago. And uh, for those that uh, want to work uh, the International Space Station or satellites <clears throat> uh, with uh, just a modest rig, you can do so. This is the um, uh, antenna system uh, that they use. This is the uh, log periodic antenna. 
And uh, this one's called the elk antenna, and that's always popular. This is the arrow antenna, <clears throat> cross-polarized. And when you're working the International Space Station uh, as a school, <clears throat> you're operating duplex. They'll give you a secret frequency, so... Uh, there's no interference on the space station output uh, that uh, they would hear because they're listening somewhere else and only the school officials uh, know where that somewhere else is, generally within the two meter band, at least so I've been told. But uh, these are uh, dual band antennas. Again, uh, that's a very popular aero antenna, <clears throat> three elements on uh, two meters, and that's plenty to pick up the International Space Station. Um, any kind of rig will do. This is a fancy one. Uh, Don Arnold, W6GPS, he's worked uh, uh, a lot of satellites, uh, uh, the FM satellites with uh, the particular Kenwood D74. But um, as Tim and others will tell you, almost any radio that is dual band or even a single band for two meters will have no problem listening to the International Space Station. And what a great way to get kids involved, and that is tracking the space station as it's going overhead, especially if we don't have a potential of a contact listening to the APRS beacon on 145.825. You'll learn a lot about space and all the satellites, the FM satellites, the upper sideband, lower sideband satellites, a lot of the foreign satellites. you learn about the geostationary one over Europe. Become a member of AMSAT. But most important, this upcoming contest, um, the actually it's an auction, not a contest. <laughs> actually, it is sort of a contest, but who's going to pay the most for the TS-890 or for that great uh, handbook from the league? This is some of the testing that goes on to each individual component that they're planning on sending up soon. And each component of the International Space Station Amateur Radio Setup has to meet very rigid specs and they test them and they test them some more and even more and it's not until those tests are 100 percent pass that they're going to allow any gizmo even a pl259 or a in connector to go up until it's been absolutely tested to the hilt so again we encourage all of you to support the ariss amateur radio on the international space station Rosalie White, K1STO, will be at Xenia, the Hamvention. She's got actually a special talk on Friday at 1.15, all about the International Space Station. <clears throat> She'll probably have results, too, as to this out-of-the-world auction sponsored by ARISS, working with AMSAT. Now, when you log on, you're not going to see capabilities to yet up load your bid, not until the uh, actual uh, auction begins, and that's going to be April 8th, Monday at 1200 Universal Time Coordinated, and go until that Sunday until 2200 Universal Time Coordinated. So I encourage all of you to get kids tuned in and turned on to working or at least listening to or at twilight, even viewing the International Space Station, because that's something they can't normally do on anything other than a ham radio set. And if they're part of a school and the school is selected, they'll be given a secret duplex frequency. And then those kids really get excited and actually work in the astronauts. So best success for those of you going for the 890 or the ARRL uh, set. And um, I know we're going to have a lot of fun next week. Just watching to see who's coming up with <clears throat> some bids uh, for this out of this world auction sponsored by ARISS. So go to ARISS.org and uh, they'll give you all of the information about uh, the International Space Station get together that is uh, coming up uh, very, very shortly. I'm just reviewing my notes to make sure I've got everything absolutely correct. And it looks like I do. So now let's tune in to ICOM America and see what they've got brewing. Create your own band opening with the IC9700. ICOM's newest SDR transceiver, the IC9700, is coming soon. 
This new radio is bringing direct sampling to the UHF-VHF weak signal world. The IC9700 all-mode transceiver is loaded with innovative features, such as dedicated amateur satellite operation, color touchscreen, built-in D-Star capability, RF direct sampling on 2 meters and 70 centimeter bands, dual independent receivers capable of full duplex operation as well as dual watch, 100 watts maximum output power on 2 meters, 75 watts max on 70 centimeters, and 10 watts max on 1.2 gigahertz. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Attention all hams! ICOM knows that ham clubs play a big role in bringing ham communities together to learn from their peers and industry leaders. As a way to give back and help you on your mission, ICOM has launched a promotion exclusively for U.S. ham clubs and the ham fest they're involved with. By registering your club, you could win ICOM swag, a Skype presentation for your club, or your ham fest an ICOM booth set up. Register today for your chance to win at icomamerica.com slash hams. Pack your bags because Dayton Hamvention is coming up from May 17th through 19th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. See the latest and greatest ICOM gear and meet hams from all over the world. You can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash hamnation and register to win. Great swag prizes like t-shirts and hats each week. And you'll automatically be entered in the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And we've got a winner for March, the winner of the ID51A Plus 2 VHF UHF D-Star Portable is Ronald KD4IJS. Congratulations, Ronald. You're really going to like that radio. But we've got another radio for April. It's the, uh, oh boy, a really great mobile, the ID5100A Deluxe, innovative 2-meter, 70-centimeter transmitter with touchscreen, D-Star and analog, built-in GPS, DVDV dual watch, optional Bluetooth board, and there's a Bluetooth and Android app available for download. A great dual-band, dual-watch transceiver from ICOM, the ID5100A Deluxe. You need to go register after this in each episode of Ham Nation at icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And who knows, maybe I'll be calling your name at the end of April. And now the man with all the news in amateur radio, it's Don Wilbanks. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2,161, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, April 3rd, 2019. Amateur Radio is back on the air at the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., the world's largest museum and research complex, has nine research centers, 19 museums, and an array of affiliates worldwide. What it did not have lately, at least not until now, was an amateur radio club. While it still has no shack to call its own, it does have a call sign. Its old call sign, NN3SI, was renewed this year in April, and the new Smithsonian Institution Amateur Radio Group is returning to the air. The club isn't just a gathering spot for staffers with the radio hobby bug, but also functions as a STEM educational resource and a player in emergency management when needed. The call sign dates back to 1976, when it was issued during the United States Bicentennial. The station was active until 2008. It plans now to operate portable and mobile and participate in a number of big events, including the Rookie Roundup, Field Day, and the ARRL June VHF Contest. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Kevin Trotman, N5PRE. Satellite enthusiasts who arrive a day early for Hamvention can devote that day to HamSat. If you can't wait for Hamvention to start, welcome to the club. Actually, welcome to the Dayton Amateur Radio Association Clubhouse. That's where AMSAT Academy will be held the day before the big event opens the gates in nearby Xenia, Ohio. Registration is open now for the Academy, where you can learn about the digital satellites orbiting the Earth and ways to work them. The all-day session is taking place on Thursday, the 16th of May, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., right there in Dayton. 
The $85 registration fee includes one year's basic membership in AMSAT, a $44 value, as well as lunch and an invitation to attend that night's AMSAT gathering at a nearby restaurant in Fairborn, Ohio. Registration is non-refundable and there is no sign-up at the door. Registration deadline is May 10th. Visit AMSAT.org for more details. It's a good year to attend. AMSAT is marking its 50th anniversary this year. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jack Parker, W8ISH. A weather and traffic net serving the American Gulf Coast could use some help. The Central Gulf Coast Hurricane Net is in need of net control operators. The net meets every day on 3935 kilohertz at 0100 UTC. According to its mission statement, the net is a directed net with the main purpose of handling of emergency traffic. Daily net operations help hams identify who is available for communications and how strong their station is. The net operates secondarily to handle routine traffic in liaison with the interstate SSB net on 3985 kilohertz. The net's main geographic target areas are central Gulf Coast states in the U.S. that are impacted by storm or flood. For more details, contact the net scribe John N5JHF at N5JHF dot John at gmail dot com. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jerry Goodrich, KF5 KRN. A reminder that the nominating period is open for the Newsline WA6ITF Young Ham of the Year Award. Full details and the nominating form can be found on our website, arnewsline.org, under the YHOTY tab. We'll present the award in August at the Huntsville Ham Fest in Alabama. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at arnewsline.org. With Kevin Trotman, N5PRE, Jack Parker, W8ISH, Jerry Goodrich, KF5KRN, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wellbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Now here's the solar update from Dr. Tamitha Scove, WX6SWW. We have a coronal hole that's rotating through the Earth's strike zone, and we have a new region that has emerged on the Earth-facing sun. What will these things mean to you? Those stories and more in this special report from Bern, Switzerland. Space weather this week continues to be very interesting. We've had a lot of small coronal holes that have been sending us some pockets of fast solar wind over the past few days, and it looks like this trend is going to continue. We have yet another irregularly shaped coronal hole that's rotating through the Earth's strike zone this week, and it will continue the sporadic storming that we've been seeing. We could easily bump up to active conditions, even storm levels at high latitudes, bringing us some sporadic aurora. On top of that, we have region 2737 that's kind of emerged on the Earth face disk you see it right here that region is not flare producing but it has boosted the solar flux and kept us at the marginal range for radio propagation and it looks like this trend is going to continue for the next few days Switching to our M4 threat meter, you can see once region 2736 rotated off of the sun's west limb, that X-ray flux took a dive and therefore by proxy so did the solar flux. Radio propagation on Earth's day side did tank a little bit. We've managed to hover in the marginal range, the low end of marginal, due to a new region that has merged on the Earth-facing disk. That's region 2737 and it is keeping that X-ray flux they're right at the low 70s, and that should continue easily over the next few days until, believe it or not, region 2736 rotates back into Earth view. Switching to our solar storm conditions, you can see back on the 24th and 25th, that was that huge solar storm fizzle. You can hardly see it in here, but things continued on being basically at unsettled conditions due to some pockets of fast solar wind. We didn't really bump up to active conditions until about the 31st, and it was only momentarily that we bumped back down to unsettled and back up to active conditions. And this has pretty much been going on for the past few days, and this will continue to go on over the next few days because we have another coronal hole that's rotating into the Earth strike zone and it's going to be sending us some more sporadic fast wind over the next uh, three or four days. What else does our sun have in store for us this week? Well this is Stereo A, it's our backside monitor. You can see here's Earth, 
here's the sun, and here's stereo A staring at the sun from behind. And when you look at stereo's view, wow, take a look at that huge bright region on the east limb of stereo's view. That is old region 2736. It is now rotated into view for stereo so we can watch what it's doing. And believe it or not, it is still active. It's still firing off some solar flares and a few solar storms here and there. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you are loving life because in about a week it looks like this bright region is going to boost the solar flux up again for you all and you'll be able to enjoy some decent day side radio propagation and aurora photographers well who knows maybe it's strong enough to launch a solar storm earthward towards us once it rotates into view but it's definitely the most exciting thing we've seen uh, in this solar minimum sun in quite some time Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone, but it's going to be a bit sporadic catching the aurora. Now, at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting active conditions with up to about a 30% chance of a major storm. But again, things are going to be pretty sporadic, and these conditions could last in through the weekend. So high latitude people, you, ha you do have a chance to catch some aurora if you're careful and diligent. Now, mid-latitudes, the story's not quite so good. We're only expecting unsettled conditions with up to about a 20 to 25 percent chance of active conditions. But again, these views are going to be extremely sporadic. So unless you're a die-hard aurora photographer, don't expect to catch much at mid-latitudes. It's going to be quite elusive. And these conditions will continue over the next couple days at mid-latitudes, but most likely will die off easily by the weekend. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is still in the green when it comes to big solar flares, which should make you GPS users very happy. GPS reception on Earth's day side should continue to be very good. But we do have region 2737 on the Earth-facing disk that has boosted the solar flux. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, you should be enjoying the low end of marginal for radio propagation on Earth's day side. But again, this region is not a full flare producer, so we don't have to worry about radio blackouts. And these conditions will continue easily over the rest of this week. And then we have big region 2736, that monster that gave us a, a, a solar storm fizzle last week or so. That should be rotating into Earth view in about seven days, and that could change this whole picture. So space weather this week continues to be a bit on the unsettled side. We have an irregularly shaped coronal hole that's rotating in through the Earth strike zone this week. It's going to be sending us some sporadic pockets of fast solar wind and could give us some very elusive aurora shows. Now, those aurora photographers at high latitudes, you do have a decent chance of catching aurora, but you're going to have to stay on your toes. Now, amateur radio and shortwave radio responders well, you know, we have a new region that has emerged on the Earth-facing disk, and although it's not a flare producer or a really incredibly bright region, it has managed to boost the solar flux back up into the low end of marginal for radio propagation on Earth's day side. So if you can kind of hang on to that for the next week or so, then that old region 2736 will rotate back into view, and that should boost the solar flux up quite a bit. So. Hang on for that, because things are going to get better. Now, as far as your GPS users are concerned, well, things are looking pretty good for you. The new region on Earth's day side is not a flare producer, so we don't have to worry about any radio blackouts. So that makes GPS reception on the day side pretty good. And on the night side, you know, the solar storming really isn't all that strong. So as long as you stay away from Aurora and stay away from the Dawn Dust Terminators, your reception should be pretty nice all the way around. I'm Tamitha Scove. Thank you for watching. And thanks, Dr. T, for the good news there and possibly some improving um, propagation coming up very soon here. Uh, we can always use that. Well, tonight on Smoke and Solder, we're, we're getting back uh, to an episode here with a little extra smoke in it. So we'll wrap it up when we come back. Some of you may remember back in episode 16 of Ham Nation, in September 2011, I built the Ham Nation regulated power supply using an LM317 linear voltage regulator. I've built those before, and they worked for a little while, but sooner or later, for some reason, the regulator just quit working. 
Same thing happened with this one right here. So I decided I'd refresh my power supply with a little newer technology. This is 180 kilohertz fixed frequency PWM bulk module, a step down DC to DC converter capable of driving five amp loads. It's supposed to be highly efficient, has low ripple and excellent line and load regulation. In addition, it's got built-in over temperature protection, current limiting, and output short circuit protection. And the output will be 1.5 to 36 volts DC at 5 amps. It also came with a little heat sink that I did attach to the chip. My transformer here is only good to 2 amps, so that's the most I can expect out of this power supply. I picked up one of these three-digit voltmeters at a ham fest several years ago. I think it was probably three or four dollars. I've been waiting on a project to put it in, and this seems like the perfect one. Here's the power supply with the modifications I've made to it. I pulled out the old linear regulator because it was no longer working, and I replaced that with the DC-DC converter module. There's the input voltage to it. There's a ground an output voltage. The board came with a 20 turn 50k ohm pot. I replaced that with a 50k ohm single turn pot. I mounted to the front of the power supply here so that I'd have easy access to change the voltage. It's not quite as high a resolution, but works well in this case. There's the voltmeter right there. I cut out the hole and mounted it in there flush. This is the rear of the voltmeter module. There are three terminals here. There's a ground that goes over to the ground. Uh, there's a center terminal here that is the input voltage that operates a module. I don't know exactly how much voltage that should be. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 12 volts. And then the last terminal here, this is a sample off the voltage that we want to measure. So there's two different voltages going into here. Now, my power supply puts out way more voltage than I think this module needs to operate off of. So I put a couple of little resistors in series right here at the output of my bridge rectifier to feed up to the voltmeter. I've got two 1K ohm resistors in series inside that insulation because I didn't have a 2K ohm. And that drops the voltage down to where I've got about 8.8 oh, .8 volts right there on that red wire operating the voltmeter. Let's see what we've got now. I've connected the power supply up to a known good meter. I've only got one decimal place here on the meter, so it can't read as high a resolution as my test meter. 1.24 over on the multimeter, 1.2 on the power supply meter, I would say that's close enough. Now I'm going up to the 20 volt scale. Incidentally, the pot I put in here has got detents in it, so it's going to kind of turn in steps as I go up and down. Let's give it a couple of clicks and see what we've got. 3.1 on the power supply, 3.07 over on the multimeter, a couple of more, 5.3 on the power supply, 5.31 on the multimeter, that's close. A few more, 8.3 on the power supply, 8.36 on the multimeter, getting off a little there, 11.8 on the power supply, 11.83 on the voltmeter, 12.6 on the power supply, 12.65 on the multimeter, step it on up, 15.6 on the power supply, 15.69 over on the meter. 18.6 on the power supply, 18.66 on the multimeter, so still pretty close there. And I got to step up to the 200 volt range here to measure any more. Kick it on up to 26.3 on the power supply, 26.3 on the voltmeter. And wide open, 37.3 on both meters. So I would say the little meter on the front of the power supply there is fairly accurate. Now that we know we can produce and measure a voltage, let's put a little load on it and see if the regulation holds up. Here's my test load. It's a 12 volt, 20 watt halogen lamp. Let's put a little voltage on it here. Is something shorted out? Uh, that doesn't hurt. 
Uh, that's not a good sign. I think I need to unplug this thing and get it out the door before it stinks the shop up. This is what I found. I pulled off the heat sink, and right there on the regulator, you can see a burn spot. The little device makes a lot of smoke. Fortunately, I've got more. Now let's test the power supply and see how it works out. I've got one of my other voltmeters over here connected directly across the terminals. 12.44 volts. That's in uh, agreement with our little built-in meter there. 12.4 volts. I've taken this meter and I've got it connected here for 20 amps. I'm on the 20 amp scale there. And I'm going to connect it in series with the load. The load is going to be this little quartz light bulb here. Yes, that fixture is mounted to an Altoids 10. There's a reason for that. There's one of these stick-on magnets on the back. That's because I've got metal shelves in here, and I could stick it under a shelf there and got a little light. The lamp that's in here is 12 volts at 20 watts. That calculates out to around 1.66 amps. Let's plug it in and see what happens here. Okay, we saw the voltage jump just a hair right there when I first plugged it in. It settled back down. We're reading about a tenth of a volt lower on this meter over here. Uh, no big deal. For the current here, we're measuring 0.81 amps or 810 milliamps. So we're not getting the full 1.66 amps that we calculated the bulb should draw. Overall, it looks like it's worked out here. Our regulator is holding steady. We're, we're actually right back on the money again here. So really, putting a load on it, at least this much load on it, doesn't really seem to have any effect on the regulation. So that's good. Now, I questioned whether or not this supply was actually delivering the current that the bulb needed. Well, just to verify it was, I've got one of these 12-volt batteries here, 9 ampere hours, so it could supply plenty of current. I connected it in place of the power supply there. I got virtually the same readings. The battery put out uh, roughly 13.5 volts. You can see I've increased the power supply to that amount. Both of them drew about 840 milliamps. So uh, the current is there. Uh, the bulb just doesn't require it. So there you go, the Ham Nation Regulated Power Supply 2019 Edition. Those little boards do work fairly well. They're not completely clean. There is a, just a little bit of noise on them, but they're probably good enough for an awful lot of applications. I would recommend when you buy the board, buy a few of them, just in case you might run across a dud. Well, interesting... Uh, development there with the little board. I'm glad I bought several of those at once. I had read posts on the internet saying, yeah, you, you might want to get more than one just for that reason. I thought perhaps, uh, you know, when I first did that, I had the little lamp there and I had my alligator clips across the pins and I thought maybe I shorted it out there and that's what happened. But I went back and zoomed in on the video and no, they weren't shorted out. So I don't know what happened to that first board. Uh, but, yeah, not good. I need to put me a fuse on the output of that thing just in case. But, uh, yeah, I let the magic smoke right out of that first one there. But, you know, it only cost me 3 or $4 to do that. Second one seems to work fine. Now, I did measure that with an oscilloscope just looking at how much noise came out of it. Uh, essentially no ripple at all. I did have about 20 millivolts of uh, just RF hash on there, you know, from the switching regulator. Uh, it wasn't bad, and I could put a little, uh, I believe I tried a 0.1 capacitor across it, and that kind of took that out. So anyway, those are uh, great little modules if you want to do some uh, regulation for bench type stuff. I don't know if I'd put it in anything permanent, but for a testing power supply, seemed to work okay. It was rated at five amps. Of course, I wasn't doing anywhere near that. I was just 
my little transformer there can only put out uh, two amps. So should be okay with that. But uh, as promised, there was a little smoke there tonight. Now, I did want to mention one thing. I, I learned a new trick here recently on a quick way to, get, to calculate decibels out in your head without using a calculator or a slide rule or, um, you know, any kind of logarithmic numbers. There's a very simple way to do it, and I had it on episode 51 of Ham College that we shot this past Friday night. If you'd like a, a good uh, QSO party trick or, or maybe something to impress the chicks with, you should go check that out. It's, uh, it's a pretty neat, uh, neat trick, and it works pretty good. Well, now Don has some information on some great antenna tuners. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by LDG Electronics. LDG, three letters that are intimately known by many a ham radio operator because LDG Electronics provides state-of-the-art automatic antenna tuners for every amateur need from QRP to QRO, fixed stations, portable, remote. The LDG tuner will match your radio to your antenna using this lightning fast proprietary tuning algorithms. I want you to check out the LDG AT1000 Pro 2. That is the flagship automatic antenna tuner. It's made for QRO or high power hams. It'll handle 1,000 watts SSB, 500 watts FM and digital. You can tune from 1.8 to 54 megahertz continuously. Match Yagi's, dipoles, inverted Vs, slopers, virtually any coax fed antenna from 6 to 1,000 ohms impedance. Tuning time? under 10 seconds. Easy to read bar graph watt meter with two selectable ranges. Dual antenna switch with 2,000 memories for each position and LDG is family owned and operated company dedicated to bringing innovative quality products to the amateur market. The focus is on anticipating and meeting your needs and providing you with world-class support. It's only a call or an email away. All the LDG tuners carry a full two-year warranty and it's fully transferable. So if you ever sell or give away your LDG tuner, the remainder of the warranty goes with it. Free return shipping on all warranty repairs, too, and all LDG products, including balance and cables, are available for purchase through select retailers. So check out which automatic antenna tuner is right for you, and then go to ldgelectronics.com to learn more. That's ldgelectronics.com, and we thank LDG Electronics for their support of Ham Nation. Time to check out what's going on in the chat room, and with that, here's Amanda. Thank you, Don. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to coordinate here. Jeff's about to walk in the door. And I was trying to tell him to stay in the car, but he keeps talking on the repeater. So hold on one second. Jeff, just hang out in the car for a few minutes here. Otherwise, we're really going to disrupt this Ham Nation show. K1DDN. <laughs> not that I'm not already. Okay. So... Let's go to some questions here. Tim, I got a couple for you. This one, this is actually a really good question. Um, Tony asks, should LOTW be used only for contest contacts or can it be used to enter regular and contest contacts? Did that make sense? Um, LOTW is Logbook of the World, which is a, a great electronic QSL uh, system that the uh, ARL has, and uh, it can be used for all QSOs. So no matter if it's during a contest or just day-to-day, -day, LOTW is good to go, man. It really is. It's a fabulous system because it's, it's very instant. So if K1DDN works K3LR, it's right now. Absolutely. Not only that, but... Um you can also upload your Cabrillo formats to LOTW and you still get all of your con contacts. So if you're using N1MM during your contest and that's the software that you prefer, heck, you can still upload that to LOTW to get your contacts loaded, correct? Yes. Uh, there's a conversion because you have to do it to um, ADIF. ADIF is, is what LOTW needs to see, but that Cabrillo file can be converted very quickly, very easily, and uh, everything goes up to LOTW. I mean, that's I did it this morning. It's there. 6,000 QSOs are, from this past weekend are on LOTW, 
and uh, that brings the total amount of K3LR QSLs uh, to 280,000 out of almost oh. 800,000 QSOs. Wow. Wow. Gordo, how many do you have on the LOTW? Um, I'm not sure I have that many because I do more monitoring than the talking. So I'm I'm very minimal on LOTW. Same here, brother. What about you, George? I have no idea, but I can tell you it's it's probably not many. Uh, I haven't been real faithful in uploading my logs to it. So I'm I'm behind probably a few years. I'm like Gordo, though. I do more listening than talking. And, um, you know, I, I'm not really a contester. I'm, I'm more of a rack chewer and a builder. So I, I just don't have that many on there. No, well, that's no problem. But I am going to put the brakes on not uploading for three years. So us people that depend on your contacts upload those records, my friend. Uh, the, nothing irritates me more than working a DX entity that hasn't uploaded for five years. Really? I really need you. Come on, confirm already. Um, I do not have, I feel like worthless. I only have around 5,500 contacts in LOTW and only about 55% of those actually confirmed. So it's a tough life, but it's getting better than it used to be. Back in the day, I think I only had about 25% confirmed, but more and more people are getting on LOTW, thank goodness, and uh, getting that squared away because it's so much better than EQSL. And um, I'm sure Tim would agree with me on that. A absolutely. LOTW, that's the way to go, Amanda. You're on the right track. And uh, 55 percent that that's a great number so keep it going let me ask there a question what, what do you guys think about uh, and i've used this in the past i don't know how popular it is right now eqsl is that is is that much of a thing now uh, <laughs> so gordo even it, left okay oh my god <laughs> <laughs> gordo ran out and amanda gave it thumbs down um George, I have to say, I, I do have a, an account on EQSL. Um, I have my logs up there as well. But uh, LOTW, with that comes the DXCC, the Worked All States, and even some of the CQ Magazine awards are available through LOTW now, like uh, CQWPX, CQWAZ. It's all available there. So, uh to me, it's about uploading these QSOs, getting the QSOs for awards. And so maybe sometime we can do a show on LOTW, Logbook of the World, to, to show everyone just how slick and easy it is to get your logs up there and get these electronic QSOs. But, you know, I'm old school. I love the paper cards. Oh, I, I, I love paper cards. Look at this. Look at that stamp. One wow. cent. Wow. And <laughs> look at these QSL paper cards from back in the old days. No, I didn't work uh, a 9 Bravo Alpha November uh, slant Kilo 3 Lima. No, no, no. I, I didn't do that. But... I still like paper QSL cards. And like Don, who's got them right behind his operating station, I loved getting QSL cards, and I respond to every single one. So for those of you looking for a response on Logbooks of the World, um, bless your heart, but send me a paper QSL card, even just a postcard, and I'll give you a Gordo Noah card right back, uh, generally the same day that I receive your paper QSL card. Absolutely. And um, I love, I have some of my favorites displayed behind me. And I'm a printer. So I love to design QSL cards <laughs> and I do love to receive them. And it's honestly one of the reasons I upgraded to a general and then to an extra because Jeff was getting all of these cool QSL cards in the mail. So I couldn't resist. I said, I have to do this. I have to make contacts. So, all right, moving on. 
Uh, Tim, you brought up searching and pouncing during the contest. And uh, somebody had asked about that in the chat room. What does that actually mean to all of us non-DXers or contesters out there? So, you know, uh, Amanda, searching and pouncing is the most popular form of operating on HF. And that means that you're actually turning the big knob, turning the VFO and looking for stations that are calling CQ. Many people feel much more comfortable actually tuning in a station, listening to it for a while, and then calling and making a QSO. So that's what searching and then pouncing. Go right yep. to it. And, I'm, a, um, <laughs> I'm that person. And, and, and much, many more stations feel more comfortable doing that than than actually trying to find a clear frequency and call CQ. And the search and pound stations that that are really good are hooked to the DX cluster, like uh, DX Summit, and uh, they will actually point and click using their mouse, and the radio will move, and the, and the QSO information goes right right into the log screen. But in this case, searching and pouncing means we're searching and then we find a station, we listen, and then we pounce. And that makes sense for so many reasons, especially during a DX contest, because a lot of times it's really hard to hear other countries because they're talking so fast and they're not speaking in their native language. So it's really hard to understand them. So you're not sure what their call sign is. And if you believe in the DX code of conduct, uh, you will listen and figure out their call sign before you jump on them and work them. So uh, it, it's a very popular mode and that's what I do most of the time to make sure I have that call sign right. And it, uh, during contest, if you're using spotting, you better make sure you claim that because that's another category. So don't cheat. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to say one other thing, Tim. Yeah, Valerie did an excellent series for us. It's a two-part series on LOTW, getting set up and then how to use it. So everyone go check NV9L's YouTube channel and you will find that information on setting up your LOTW account. Very, very important. So one other question, Gordo, this one's for you. Um, from Randy, W7ETL, he says, is coaxial horizontal sky type loop possible? Tell us Let's all about see. it. Um, a coaxial horizontal, uh, give that to me again. Coaxial horizontal sky type loop. I will look that one up in that uh, that one um, I'm, I'm not real familiar with. But as Tim will tell you, the higher up you get things in the clear, the better the uh, comms range. So let me look that one up and I'll get it back to you next week. We also had a comment two weeks ago that uh, differed that the coaxial dipole was not as broad banded as I was alluding to. I've done several tests and I'm continuing to do so, but they seem much more broad banded at my location, but we will investigate further. So let me add that to my look it up, Amanda. I love investigations. Uh, with that, that's all I have. I'm just going to go over the nets real quick. Like we have no 40 meter net. Unfortunately, Kevin had to work late tonight. So scratch that one. But we have the 80 meter, 75 meter net on 3905. We have D star on 14 Charlie and DMR on TAC 311. And uh, with that, we're ready to wrap it up. Take it away, George. Well, thank you, Amanda, and thanks, Tim and Gordo. Let's go around the horn one more time before we leave just to see if anyone's got any final thoughts. Uh, Tim, thanks for being here tonight. Anything final for the audience? You know, you know George, it, the team exuberance that was here over the weekend just reinvigorated my love of HF operating in amateur radio, just seeing, you know, eyes wide open and just uh, just getting on the radio, making contacts all over the world. And so team exuberance, my hat is off to you. 
you have uh, you have reinvigorated my drive to to keep building and keep doing things, and I'm I'm very hopeful that youth will be a part of of many amateur radio stations around the world. And you know, George, the this group of six is I really believe is is part of what our future is all about. And uh, these, these kids are gonna, gonna absolutely change and nurture this, ho- this hobby that is so good to us. And George, next week, I'm gonna be live in Petaluma. So um, I'll be out on the West Coast. The uh, International DX Convention is next week in Visalia, California. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go to one of the uh, San Francisco uh, baseball games on uh, Wednesday, and I think I'm going to leave early and head north to Petaluma. So I'll see you all live on Ham Nation next week on Wednesday and uh, looking forward to it. So thanks very much for hosting tonight, George. And a big shout-out to all the volunteers at the Dayton Hamvention. Uh, it's going to be a great show, third year out in Xenia. And congratulations to Liz, KE8FMJ, who is gathering all the big prizes. It's going to be worth waiting for on, on Sunday. All right. Thanks again, Tim. And sounds like you've got a fun event lined up for next week. I bet you have a lot of friends at that convention. Boy, I'd like to go to that one. Gordo, any final thoughts from out west? Well, we so much appreciate Ham Nation viewers and listeners, as well as those on uh, WTWW shortwave by embracing Ham Radio, because your interest tonight, over an hour, will spread to those kids, as well as to those adults that said, you know, I've heard about Ham Radio, tell me more. So thank all of you for making ham radio happen which you're doing tonight george okay uh good comment there gordo amanda i just want to reiterate that yes the youth is our future and just remember all of these these young gals and guys are going to be on the boards of all of our clubs soon and they're going to be making most of the decisions and being (laughs) proactive so right remember that and let's treat them well because they're going to be our decision makers and we want ham radio to stay the way it is but yet we want to go further than that just uh, like modes like ft8 and stuff and they're the ones that make that happen so let's appreciate them for what they're going to be doing for us okay that's a great comment too and uh yeah i i'm thrilled to hear about that event and uh, how well it went this past weekend and you know i would like to see a lot more young people come into the hobby because uh we could use some more young people um, on events like field day or or ham fest or any event where we need to um, shuffle ham wares back and forth put up antennas and all of that, and I want to encourage everyone, if you're if you're working with some young people in ham radio, be an Elmer. Share some tips with them. Uh, talk about what you are doing as you're doing it. Pass those, those tricks right on down the line there because they are going to be learning a lot of new things. As a matter of fact, they're going to be learning so much that some of the, the old tricks might just – Pass them right on by if you don't share it. So share your tips and your ham radio knowledge with the younger generation as we go along. I do want to mention uh, one other thing here. You know, we want to know what you've been building. Uh, Randy's looking for more photos and descriptions of what it is you're working on. Send them to hamprojects at twit.tv and you could be in a future episode of Show Us Your Projects. Well, that's it for tonight. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. So from Jackson, Mississippi, I'm W5JDX73. 
573. And don't discount the youth because they don't have as much experience as you. Just going to put that out there too.